their lives are at risk. And when they are denied language rights in education, their futures are at risk. Millions of people in China today face these challenges due to the state's denial of language rights. This happens primarily in two ways, erasure and suppression. Erasure refers to the state's refusal to acknowledge the existence of most of China's languages by calling them dialects. To put this in perspective, imagine if German, English and Norwegian were defined as dialects of a single language. Imagine if your government told you what language you speak, how would you feel? In China, Eurasia means that from the country's 300 or so languages, only about 56 are recognized as languages, one for each of the country's nationalities. Most people in China speak unrecognized languages, whether they belong to the Han majority or to a minority group. Most people in China are therefore completely denied their language rights. Our research demonstrates the catastrophic impact of this denial in Tibet. Tibetan people in China use about 30 unrecognized languages, not including Tibetan. People who use these unrecognized languages face linguistic barriers everywhere, in school, media, government, healthcare, the legal system, and so on. When the government refuses to remove these barriers, people are forced to adapt by changing their language to either Tibetan or Chinese. Meanwhile, recognized languages like Uyghur, Mongolian, and Tibetan are suppressed. Suppression happens through the gradual dilution of, Chinese, of the Chinese constitutions, language freedoms, and the pervasive under-implementation of protections for minority languages. Suppression also takes place through the encroachment of the national language, Mandarin, into spaces for minority languages, part of a broader plan to universalize Mandarin amongst the entire population. The cumulative impact of erasure and suppression mean that at least half of China's languages are currently losing speakers or signers as they switch to dominant languages. In an open democratic society, people would be lobbying and protesting to change this unjust system. But in China, particularly under Xi Jinping, civil society has become increasingly repressed domestically and isolated internationally. China's citizens will therefore be denied an unprecedented historic opportunity to defend language rights, namely the United Nations International Decade for Indigenous Languages, which starts this year. China will prevent its citizens from participating in this event because it denies that it has indigenous people and it denies its colonial history. The goal of this decade is leaving no one behind and no one outside. We have a responsibility to extend this inclusion to people in China to ensure that they are not left out or behind. So here are some suggestions of how we can do this. Number one, the US must pressure China to clarify whether its citizens are able to identify as indigenous and whether they can participate in the UN decade. And an ideal time to do this is China's upcoming universal periodic review in the UN Human Rights Council in November 2023. China's efforts, uh, secondly, China's efforts to isolate its citizens from international civil society need to be countered. We must raise awareness inside China of language rights and of activities taking place globally during the UN decade. Number three, with specific regard to Tibet, earmarking funding for Tibet's unrecognized languages will make a huge difference. And this can be done using funds allocated under the Tibet Policy Act. Number four, Finally, the US needs to lead by example. The UN Declaration of the Rights for Indigenous People should be formally endorsed and its obligations respected. Failing to do so will enable China to defer attention from their language rights violations and onto America's. Thank you for listening and uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. And now we'll turn to Mr. Toguchug. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Co-Chair, and distinguished uh, member of the Commission for holding this hearing. My name is Enkwat Tachuk. I'm a Mongolian from Southern Mongolia, also known as Inner Mongolia. What's happening in Southern Mongolia today is what the Mongolians regard as a wholesale cultural genocide aimed at 
total eradication of Mongolian language, culture, and identity. In 2020, responding to China's new language policy, the Mongolians carried out a massive resistance movement. 300,000 Mongolian students went on a total school strike. The Chinese authorities responded with massive uh, arrests. An estimated eight to ten pro, um, eight to ten thousand protesters have been arrested, detained, imprisoned, and placed under house arrest. Eleven lost their lives in defense of their rights to their mother tongue. What followed this heavy-handed crackdown was a full-scale cultural genocide campaign, the scope of which has extended far beyond the simple switch of language in schools. Learn Chinese and become a civilized person has been an official slogan publicly promoting Chinese supremacy. Mongolian language programs have been removed from radio, television, and newspapers or replaced with the Chinese one. Students are subject to military-style training and must sing red songs to extol the greatness of China. Teachers are brought to the communist red base Yan'an to receive a patriotic education. To justify the campaign, the Chinese National Congress announced last year that the local laws on the right to education in minority languages are unconstitutional. Subjects on Mongolian culture and history have been removed from uh, curriculums for emphasizing Mongolian ethnic identity. All extracurricular activities for learning Mongolian have been banned. Mongolian traditional arts and performance have been altered to adopt the Chinese style to reflect the superiority of Chinese culture. Mongolian sacred sites have been taken over by Chinese tr traditional art performers and Mongolian customs and ritual ceremonies are scorned and mocked. Sculptures, monuments, and buildings with Mongolian characteristics have been taken down. Signs in Mongolian have been removed from schools, buildings, streets, and parks. Mongolian publications have been banned Books have been removed from shelves. Printing and copy service have been ordered not to provide service for any materials written in Mongolian. Postal and courier service are instructed not to deliver any Mongolian books and publications. Starting December 2020, a region-wide training program called the Training for the Firm Inculcation of the Chinese Nationality Common Identity was launched. All Mongolian students, teachers, government employees, party members, and ordinary herders were targeted for the training. A 47-page pamphlet marked as an internal document was issued to detail the urgency and goal of the training and to compel Mongolians to fully accept the Chinese identity and Chinese culture. The document also warns Mongolians that the wrong path of narrow nationalism can lead to the return of national separatism. The trainees told us that during the training, they must denounce their narrow nationalism and nationalistic feeling. They must surrender all of their social contact and the details of their online activities to the authorities. They are forced to confess their supposed mistakes, including wearing Mongolian clothes and singing Mongolian songs. They had to answer multiple questionnaires designed to assess their ideological improvement. One of the questions a trainee said was, how many Chinese friends do you have? Those who answered none or few had to go through further training before they are allowed to graduate. Before their release, all trainees signed the paper promising that they would not in engage in any activities highlighting Mongolian characteristics or expressing Mongolian nationalistic feeling. This is what's happening in Southern Mongolia today. Considering these deterring conditions, China's determination to erase the Mongolian language, culture, and identity, and the lack of support from the international community, I would like to make the following recommendations to the United States Congress. One, conduct further hearings and testimonies to investigate the serious human rights violations in Southern Mongolia, in particular, the ongoing cultural genocide. Two, Establish the Mongolian language broadcast on Voice of America and or Radio for Asia to help Southern Mongolians have access to the free and democratic world. Three, introduce and pass legislation similar to the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act and Tibet Policy and Support Act 
to support the 6 million Southern Mongolians in their effort to defend their basic human rights and fundamental freedoms. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your, your testimony about the many, many ways that uh, Mongolian language and culture are being impacted. We're now turning to Ms. Taitong. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, Chairman Merkley, members of the committee and CECC staff for this opportunity. As a Tibetan who has been working on the Sino-Tibetan conflict for more than two decades, I can say safely, it takes a lot to shock me. But last year, when my colleagues and I began research into reports that Tibetan children were being sent to state-run boarding schools at an alarmingly high rate, we were stunned by what we found. Under the cover of darkness of China's near total information blackout of Tibet, the Chinese authorities have been constructing a massive colonial boarding school system that threatens the future survival of the Tibetan people and nation. These residential boarding schools are the cornerstone of a broader effort to wipe out Tibetan resistance by eliminating the three pillars of Tibetan identity, language, religion, and way of life. The schools streamline and fast track this by ripping Tibetan children from their roots, stealing the language from their tongues, and trying to replace their identity with Chinese identity. In our report, we find that at least 800,000 to 900,000 Tibetan children, representing nearly 80% of all Tibetan children ages 6 to 18, are now separated from their families and living in colonial boarding schools. And this number does not include four and five-year-olds being made to live in boarding preschools. These children are forbidden from practicing Tibetan Buddhism, they're cut off from authentic Tibetan culture, and they're not allowed to study in their own language. Instead, they're forced to study in Chinese under mostly Chinese teachers from textbooks that represent China's history and culture while completely denying Tibet's own rich and ancient history and culture. On top of this, they're subjected to intense political indoctrination. And most Tibetan parents have no choice but to send their children away to these schools because China shut down all the village schools and nearly all the alternatives. Parents who try to resist or refused, refuse are threatened, harassed, fined, and face other serious punishments. One person from Tibet described the anguish of these separations for young children. Quote, I know of children aged four to five who don't want to be separated from their mothers. They are forced to go to boarding schools. In some cases, the children cry for days, sticking to their mother's laps, begging not to be sent away, and even refusing to go back. End quote. My five-year-old son started kindergarten this year. To think of sending him away at this age, to live apart from me for the rest of his school-age life, to think I wouldn't be able to comfort him or protect him day to day, is devastating. And to know China is doing this intentionally so that Tibetan children are isolated from the influence of their parents and families is enraging. In the US, Canada, and Australia, residential boarding schools for Native American, Indigenous, and Aboriginal children are finally recognized as horrific and shameful mistakes of the past. Now is seen as the time for inquiries, reparations, and apologies, not as a time when any government would be deliberately implementing this genocidal model and on such a massive scale. But this is exactly what Beijing is doing. China's colonial boarding schools, together with policies that severely restrict the use of Tibetan language, that seek to hollow out Tibetan Buddhism and end the nomadic way of life, threaten Tibetan existence in every space in Tibet. What's happening in front of our eyes is the annihilation of Tibet as a civilization, as an identity, as a culture. It is cultural genocide, and Tibetans everywhere know it. Just last month, 25-year-old Sewan Norbu, a famous Tibetan pop star, self-immolated in front of the Botala Palace in Hasa. He had every reason to live. He was young, successful, college-educated. He had a family and resources, and his whole life was ahead of him. But he gave it all up in the ultimate sacrifice at the most meaningful location and political moment for Tibetans, 
on the eve of the anniversary of the 1959 Tibetan National Uprising. His life and lyrics suggest he did this because he wanted to send a message that no matter what personal success we may achieve, what matters most is our roots, our homeland, our culture, and our freedom to live on our own land and be who we are. Selwyn Norbu's final act illuminates a simple truth that's held strong in Tibet for 70 years under Chinese occupation. That generation after generation of Tibetans have shown their love and allegiance is to Tibet, to the mountains, to the grasslands, to our mother tongue, our great sages, spiritual teachers and leaders, most especially to His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, and not to China, because Tibetans are not Chinese. And though Tibetans in Tibet continue to battle courageously against China's onslaught, they can't do it alone. They need people and governments in the free world to step up. And there is so much more that can be done. I think global opposition to Russia's invasion of Ukraine has shown us how much the international community can do. We need to use every tool available to fight these genocidal dictators. Because a state that so blatantly flouts international rules and norms and indeed actively seeks to undermine them, threatens us all. And the fate of Tibetans and Uyghurs, Southern Mongolians, Hong Kongers, and Taiwanese affects us all. I'll end my remarks here and save my specific recommendations for the Q&A, and I'd also like to submit our report on China's colonial boarding school system in Tibet for the record. Thank you very much. Thank you. Without objection, it will be submitted for the record. And now we'll turn to uh, Ms. Abduweli. Thank you all and gave me this opportunity. Mr. Abduweli, excuse me. Exactly, yeah. Let me start uh, with the uh, historical uh, narrative. Like uh, Uyghur, <clears throat> after Chinese communist rule, uh, Uyghur uh, faced Uyghur language faced uh, difficulty first. The first, like Uyghur alphabet revised. It means that after 1949, like Uyghurs cannot read uh, what they have, their ancestor had written. For example, that like we cannot read, I cannot read what my grandpa had written in Uyghur. And second, in 1940, 1956, uh, Chinese government uh, changed Uyghur alphabet to a uh, Russian, like uh, Cyrillic alphabet. And then we have another literacy and people cannot read uh, the, uh, in five years after 1914. And like 1962, Uyghur alphabet changed it a uh, third time. And it's a Chinese uh, phonetic pinyin like uh, uh, latin alphabet and it used until 1979 uh, uh, and uh, and then into 1982 uh, it changed again it means that after 1949 Uyghur experienced four times alphabet changing it means that like we have like millions of people become illiteracy because of this alphabet changing. And um, in, uh, 2000, in 1950, uh, 1982, uh, since 1982, uh, our alphabet hasn't been changed, but uh, our uh, orthography, like a spelling system, changed a lot, uh, experienced five times. And it made people uh, a lot of trouble and they cannot like communicate with the written language because of this. And um, like since 1997, uh, uh, Uyghur uh, started to, uh, Uyghur language started to uh, like uh, restrict it. And um, in 2002, uh, Uyghur language uh, removed from uh, higher education, like uh, from higher education like uh, university, community college, and the technology college, all uh, higher education system Uyghur uh, removed, replaced as Han Chinese in education system. And because of this, 2006, Uyghur intellectuals in Urumqi 
started the campaign to uh, restore uh, legal rights of Uyghur. And but um, this uh, peaceful campaign uh, ended up with uh, one Uyghur uh, sentenced 12 years, Memtemin Elyar, and another uh, more than 10 Uyghurs sentenced with different uh, term. And uh, in 2011, I started my uh, mother language campaign and I had my uh, mother language kindergarten. And uh, because of this, I was arrested in August 19, 2013. And I uh, spent my 428 day days in uh, Chinese uh, detention center. And I was uh, questioned, interrogated, uh, more than six months and just uh, let me um, confess and just just let me admit that i have done this mother language campaign to separate china and like build uh, independent uyghur country um and i am um, sexually abused and tortured and like i experienced six um, six months uh, in torture and i spent um, 428 days without sunshine and without using appropriate toilet and um, without any health care. And since uh, 2017, uh, Chinese policy against Uyghur totally uh, like um, worse and then Uyghur totally banned from public life. And um, Uyghur textbooks collected and burned in front of the students and the Uyghur textbook editors arrested depending on Uyghur Yelp documentation uh, about 400 Uyghur uh, writers who participated in editing this Uyghur textbook got arrested and the thousands of mother language teachers got arrested among them there are my friends Ahmed Chanjima he sentenced 14 years and there are uh, like uh, three uh, Uyghur intellectuals sentenced life imprisonment and one sentenced to death. Uh, his name is uh, Sattar Saud. And second, uh, Han Chinese officials appointed every Uyghur family and uh, force Uyghurs uh, speak Chinese at home and monitor uh, their uh, cultural practice. And uh, third, Uyghur kids replaced from their um, home and they um, forced to uh, study at the boarding school. And depending on the other reasons, there are more than 900,000 Uyghur kids are in boarding school right now. And uh, those, we know that as we know more than now, up to 3 million Uyghurs are concentration camp and their kids are in special uh, kids camp. I met two of them um, because of they are a Turkish citizen and they uh, saved by a Turkish uh, government. And I met them in Istanbul in 2011, December. And when I uh, asked and they forgot their language in two years, they arrested in 2017 uh, March and they released in 2019, December. During two years, they totally forgot their mother language. At the time when they got arrested, the younger one is uh, four years old, the other one is six years old. In two years, they forgot their language 100%. And we can imagine that like, uh, that up to three million Uyghurs are in concentration camp and their kids are in kids camp, so-called boarding school. And we can imagine what happened to those kids. And then uh, Uyghur kids uh, replaced from their um, homeland. For example, that my niece, Saida, he replaced from his home and from his homeland. Now he is studying in Chinese boarding school in Chinese majority city, not at home. And um, Uyghur kids um, forced to um, separate from their family, like they have to study in, like live in 
a board in kindergarten. And uh, uh, depending on other young since 2017, like boarding kindergarten in uh, Uyghur region increased more than 100 times. It's, in, it's increasing very, very, very quickly. And uh, fifth, and um, Uyghur kids uh, um, sent to like uh, kindergarten in inland China, not in Uyghur, East Turkestan. And it's really dangerous. And uh, like, uh, it means that those, we cannot find uh, where they are at the end because they uh, like, will um, like uh, sub submerge in Chinese society. It's really dangerous, especially the like uh, kindergarten in uh, like uh, Xi'an accepted the uh, Uyghur uh, like uh, orphan kids. We don't, we, they call it orphan kids, but we don't know they are orphan or not because of their, maybe their parents are in concentration camp, they sent to those, like uh, in Chinese, fully Yuan, it's uh, orphan orphanage, Chinese orphanage. And um, um, like uh, Uyghur kids in uh, kindergarten, they, uh, uh, they were not allowed to speak Uyghur. And uh, like the social media um, video, I received and said that like, uh, the teacher asked the kid's name and the, the, the kid said, I was not allowed, I'm not allowed to uh, tell my name in Uyghur. I have to tell my name in Chinese. That those kids cannot even tell their name in Uyghur. Not uh, they, speak they speak that language. They cannot even tell their name in their mother tongue because of afraid. And I think uh, we need to take uh, urgent action. And I waited for this testimony for like uh, more than five years. At the end, uh, thank you everyone to give me this opportunity. And I think we need to uh, do, uh, we need to take urgent action, especially for those innocent kids who separated from their family, who separated from their homeland, who separated from their culture. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your powerful testimony. Uh, the Senate is holding a, a, a vote on a required timeline, so I'm going to turn this over to Co-Chair Representative McGovern. I hope to be back, but it's a little uncertain. It may be back-to-back -back votes, uh, uh, but I just want to, to note especially the testimony about the combination of the assault on use of the language and ripping children out of their family's arms to separate them change the language, change the culture. It's an abomination. And you all have made that uh, very clear today about the extensive use, both in the Uyghur communities and Mongolian communities and the Tibetan communities. Uh, thank you, I hope to return. But if not, I turn this to uh, Representative McGovern. Thank you very much. Um, and I wanna thank all the witnesses for your, for your testimony. Um, let me begin um, with Mr. Togochag, um, in your testimony, you advocate for the creation of a Mongolian language service through the Voice of America and Radio Free Asia. And as I understand, uh, Voice of America has currently or in the past broadcast in some 80 languages, but never Mongolian. Uh, can you expand on what a Mongolian uh, VOA service would mean for Southern Mongolians? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. So, um, Voice of America or Radio Frisia, they uh, do not have any Mongolian service at this moment. And uh, I, I, I don't think in the past they had never had it uh, either. So, um, having a Mongolian service will be very helpful for the Mazar Mongolians because there is no um, uh, the Mongolians do not have any any uh, channel or any um, way to communicate with the uh, free and democratic world, and then their their um, situation, their um, conditions are uh, largely underreported. And um, so, if uh, if we have uh, such a um, 
program, um, broadcast service that will help them um, to um, understand what's going on in the free and democratic world. And all, in the same time, also, uh, it will allow them to, uh, you know, um, have their voice heard to the international community and expose the uh, the human rights violations that are happening in, in Southern Mongolia, in particular, the uh, ongoing cultural genocide um, that uh, is aiming at uh, the complete um, erasure of Mongolian language, uh, culture, and identity. No, I, I appreciate that, and that's a, I think a helpful um, suggestion, and it's something we should explore in the upcoming appropriations process. Ms. Tetong, um, your testimony references the troubling experience in the United States, Canada, and Australia with residential boarding schools for Indigenous children. Uh, can you speak to your perspective um, as a native of Canada on how the Canadian experience can help us view what you report about boarding schools in Tibet in terms of accountability, restitution, and, and social justice? Thank you. I think it was one of the um, most uh, disturbing parts of, of what we were doing when we were researching and writing this report that a number of us on uh, the team of Tibet Action were Canadian. Um, and we were the unmarked graves of First Nations children were being uncovered in Canada from the residential schools there as we were writing this report. And it was haunting for all of us. It also gave us a you know, great sense of urgency to get this story out. Um, not that they're exactly the same situation, but that uh, it's happening again in another place in a slightly different way but but the intent is the same and i think for us you know the key right now is that people don't know that this is happening because the chinese have so effectively blocked uh information from leaving tibet they've so they've scared people from saying what's happening on the ground and they are hiding what they're doing um but the Chinese government cares what the world thinks, and this is why they have all of these hidden policies in Tibet. It's so that they can avoid international scrutiny. Um, they're hiding, you know, the, the presence, the uh, boarding preschools or kindergartens for four and five-year-olds. They're actively hiding their existence. We know there are boarding schools for, um, there are preschools and kindergartens that are day schools. And we see those on Ch in Chinese state propaganda. But the actual boarding preschools, they're actively hiding. Um, and so we know that the key right now is to, to expose and condemn directly and openly. We need the US government to do that. Um, that is the beginning. That's where we start. We need the US government and, and to work with like-minded governments around the world to put a spotlight on this issue and to say it's unacceptable and that these schools need to be um, children need to be returned to their parents and they need to have access to uh, high quality mother tongue education in their local areas, just like any of us, um, uh, you know, who grew up in uh, free and open societies do, um, no matter how rural or whatever the challenges may be. I think it's important to note that in China itself, the um, rate, you know, to rate of uh, students even in rural areas uh, who are the rate of boarding is drastically lower. So Tibetans are um, are boarding at like five times the rate in, in the case of one primary school comparison that we did, primary age comparison, at five times the rate in just central Tibet or what China calls the Tibetan Autonomous Region alone. Uh, I think the other thing that we need is to see, you know, the world has collectively condemned uh, uh, residential school policy, the, the practice of separating children from their parents in order to influence, to change who they are, to erase their culture and identity. And we need to see that the UN uh, speaks out on this, that Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, breaks her silence on Tibet. She hasn't even said Tibet uh, since 2018 when she took up this mandate. So um, we need member states, we need the US government to push for accountability also uh, at the UN. Thank, thank you. And I, um, you know, as you were speaking, I, um, I was on a delegation with Speaker Pelosi 
I think it was back in 2015 um, when they allowed us, uh, the Chinese government actually uh, allowed us to go into Lhasa uh, and um, and try to micromanage and control every single moment uh, of that visit. But despite all of those efforts, um, we were amazed and quite frankly inspired by Tibetans who approached us uh, to uh, to talk about, uh, among other things, the importance of their language, the importance of their culture, uh, the importance of giving their children um, a future in which the language and culture were a reality. Um, this is who they. This is their identity. This is who they are, and. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was a trip that, on one hand, was 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 depressing and shocking because of the Chinese government's repressive behavior, but on the other hand, inspiring, um, you know, and motivating because people at great risk uh, found ways to communicate to us directly, and um, and uh, you know, I will I will never ever ever forget it, um, and. Um, uh, but but thank you for your response, um, uh, Dr. Ro Roche. Um, you know many of us assume there is a single Tibetan language, uh, but you testify to the diversity of languages spoken by Tibetans, and I appreciate the map that you provided us. Uh, 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 would a person from Lhasa be able to communicate with a person from the Dalai Lama's hometown of Amdo? Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, question. Just to, to very quickly answer answer that part, it depends on who those people were. There's great difference between the spoken languages between Arthur and the far northern Amdo. Um, and, and if two people met on the streets, chances are that they would not be able to communicate. But if they were educated in the common written language, if they had experience communicating with Tibetans from a wide variety of backgrounds, then they, they would probably be able to communicate. There's flexibility around that issue. Um, but those are two examples of what linguists call Tibetic languages, which means that they are varieties of Tibetan. Uh, there are also about a quarter of a million Tibetans that use languages which are uh, much more different from, than those uh, group of Tibetic languages. They're vastly different from each other. And regardless of whether they were literate, regardless of how cosmopolitan they were, regardless of the, the amount of exposure, and without concerted study, uh, they would not be able to communicate with, with one another. So those languages, to give a, an example that might help, it would be as different as Swedish and Italian, for example. Showing these are all the current languages. most of the Tibetans who speak those languages, their communities are quite like small, several thousand uh, people amongst a broader population of over six million people. Um, and given the situation that I've described, where the state completely denies language rights in any forum in education, healthcare, media, uh, governance, etc. Uh, that those languages are facing a very serious uh, predicament. And in terms of thinking through these issues that we're talking about today, about the, the impact of um, the denial of language rights, thinking about the, the state's goals in this, thinking about the program of sinicization and so on, we can think of these smaller languages spoken by Tibetans as the canary in the coal mine. They point the direction of where the actions of the state are going for other languages and what we see uh, across all of those languages is uh, people are switching away from them they're no longer transmitting those languages to their children so in the, the an expert survey that i did of linguists who work in this area i asked their assessment whether those languages would still be spoken in the future generations and the answer was uh, in almost every case that they would no longer be, that the, the children would be switching either to some form of Chinese or some form of Tibetan language. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm technologically challenged, but for those who are watching this, I mean, this is the map that you provided us and all these different colors show the different distinct 
kind of Tibetan uh, languages and dialects, which I think is, is is fascinating. Something that we don't always appreciate. I mean, when we're talking about uh, prote protecting the language, how how would an understanding of this linguistic diversity help the U.S. protect Tibetan language? And and you made a recommendation earlier, but uh, and maybe you could expand on it. How funding in the Tibetan Policy and Support Act could be used. Yeah, thank you for that question. So the, uh, these languages face a, a very intense predicament and the speakers of these languages, also the people who sign them, because we should include Tibetan sign language here as well. Um, these communities have no support from anywhere. They want to maintain these languages. They, in instances where they can, create projects to support these languages, educational uh, initiatives, community um, uh, chances to use the language and so on. W one of the most clear examples of the desire to use these languages was seen when the COVID pandemic broke into bed uh, and no public health care information was available to these communities in the languages that they understood best and which uh, they trusted the most as well. And so that was creating great anxiety and putting those people at risk. So they initiated these uh, community public health information translation projects on their own without any funding, funding without any support and so on. So the recommendation that I uh, make, given the, the Tibet Policy Act in part focuses on the protection of Tibetan language and culture is the idea that uh, funds could be earmarked specifically for these languages. And that money uh, could be used, for example, to transmit information to those communities about language rights, the fact that they have them, uh, how those language rights are denied. Uh, if it was possible to get money to the communities on the ground to work with them, there is all sorts of uh, projects that could be done to help those communities use their languages to develop them, for example, developing writing systems, uh, recording the languages, uh, helping develop vocabulary to use in new situations. And there are ample examples all around the world of different projects, different methods for helping to support a language uh, that some of this funding could be used for and that communities, uh, Tibetan communities inside China could learn from. Well, thank you. you know, and I know USAID has money for this, um, and I think maybe we need to work with USAID to find a grantee, grantee that could actually, you know, actually do what, what you're talking about. Um, I, I, I have other questions here, but I know I, I'm not sure if Congresswoman Steele uh, is um, still on the line. Um, yes. Okay. I, I wanted to yield to, why don't I yield to you for your questions, and I'll come back to me. All right. Thank you, Co-Chair McGovern, um, and thank you very much, all the witnesses. It is alarming and disheartening that the CCP is working to restrict religious freedom and trying to eradicate entire cultures. The CCP is separating children from their parents, home, and communities that you know I can really think of. This is one more outrageous example of racism and troubling human rights violation at the hands of the CCP. Having said that, Ms. Ladon, if I pronounce it wrong, I'm sorry, but uh, you mentioned that private schools run by monasteries and Tibetan communities have been shut down by CCP. We already heard that uh, Mr. Togocha for recommendations of what United States Congress has to do, but what can global leaders to do stop this violation? I try to let people, whole world know during the Olympic that what China has been doing, but I didn't get any responses from any corporate sponsors, Olympic that they've been spending billions of dollars. So could you tell us that what global leaders has to do stop this violation? Yeah, I think the key is um, and we can see this happening more and more, but is for like-minded governments, global leaders to work together and to um, coordinate strategies and approaches in a way that really targets, um, like for example, in the case of sanctions, I think this whole area um, 
you know, unlike, say, targeting military or security people, officials, um, the area of education policy uh, just seems it's, it's such a different uh, target. But there are Chinese um, academics and education policy experts who are working to, you know, they're conceptualizing and they're operationalizing these programs to that are separating, you know, nearly a million Tibetan children from their parents and that are um, essentially threatening that, you know, an entire generation of Tibetans and those that come from now on will not speak Tibetan. Um, so they are, they're designing these genocidal policies and overseeing them and they should be targeted, I think, for sanctions and other, and other things. And, and governments can coordinate, I believe, to do that in a way that perhaps, you know, the security officials and the top, top officials aren't so concerned about their international reputation or their travel or whatever, but academics do. I mean, that's, you know, so much of what it's about is reputation and your international's credibility. And I think this group of people who are really key, playing key roles in all of this, the rollout and the separation of very young children from their families, um, they play a key role. And they, if we want to sort of change behavior and send a very clear message, I think they should absolutely be uh, targeted with sanctions. Very essential. Thank you very much. So parents, not the CCP, have the right to choose how their child will be educated. That's what we are practicing here. We try to. What, why is the CCP so threatened by having a diverse community? Mr. Tetang. Uh, Ms. Tetang, sorry. Because difference... I think the key is difference that that because Tibetans are not Chinese, because Uyghurs are not Chinese, um, uh, Mongol, Southern Mongolians, we have our distinct histories, our distinct national histories. This is about um, wiping out resistance to Chinese Communist Party rule. And uh, all of the efforts of the Chinese Communist Party in Tibet over 70 years have failed all of the violence you think of their economic their political their military power and might and somehow tibetans are still resisting and a whole new generation of tibetans that has no memory of a free tibet is still fighting and that's because who we are at our core is not chinese and and when tibetans are being taught only about chinese history and culture in this intense nationalistic um curriculum they know that they're not reflected there. It, it, maybe it takes a littler kid some time to figure that out, but in the end, Tibetans know they're not Chinese. And when they leave these schools or when they go out into the world, they face such incredible racism and discrimination that their instinct, of course, is to turn inward and to ask questions about who they are and where is Tibet in all of this. And so I think this is about wiping out resistance to Chinese Communist Party rule in places uh, where the Chinese, you know, party rules with a colonial occupation, you know, that the Chinese uh, government has taken over by force and maintains control by force. And, and parents, parents' influence needs to be, uh, I guess they believe, broken. You know, these children, if they're removed from their parents, their families and their communities, and if they can forget who they are, maybe that resistance will end. And I think they're, they're sadly mistaken. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, for uh, Mr. Abdulali Arab, you know, my both parents fled from North Korea communism during Korean War. So, you know, I've been hearing so much about the communists. And now I am proud American immigrant who is living her American dream. I speak Korean and Japanese as my first and second and English as my third. It is important to embrace diversity and respect other cultures. I speak common greetings to my constituents and friends on a daily basis. Why is the CCP creating new language restrictions and engaging in religious persecution? What are they afraid of? Um, I think uh, it's mainly because of uh, uh, Uyghur uh, keep uh, protecting their language, especially like uh, uh, after July uh, 5th, we have a demonstration in uh, 2009 
July 5th. And after the demonstration, there is a like a mass uh, arrest happened and then a thousand of people got arrested. And after that, Chinese go government a uh, little bit changed the policy and uh, like uh, gave some economical benefit to the people. But uh, at the time, I, I witnessed what happened and the Uyghur language, like for example, Uyghur books flourished and the Uyghur like um, uh, films flourished and uh, like uh, if like uh, Uyghur poetry sold very well after this economic benefit like Uyghur not shrinked instead of that Uyghur increased the power because of uh, the after the economical development and people like uh, realized to take that language alive keep that language and they, they like uh, use money to support it and when I got my like mother language kindergarten, um, like investment is already enough. I have enough investment and I have enough support. At that time we have like, uh, we started our campaign online. We have uh, 500,000 followers online to support us. So I think the main reason is because of this, this power, because of this power of identity, power of culture. Are you afraid of this? Thank you very much, Mr. Ch Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I think uh, Chairman Merkley is back. I am uh, back, and, and thank you very much. And I'll apologize in advance if I ask questions that others have already asked, but maybe it's worth uh, re-emphasizing. And let me want to start with the depiction of a strategy by the Chinese government to universalize Mandarin among the entire population of China. Do you all agree, I'll just ask each of you to comment very briefly, do you all agree that getting everyone to speak Mandarin is the ultimate goal of the sinicization campaign that, that, that we've all talked about today? Dr. Roche, you wanna kick that off? Sure. Yes, I think it is. This is the goal. The, the The policy has been in place for a while now. The plan has been set. The targets have been announced and shifted year by year. They target different regions as the as it progresses. And the aim is to have everyone uh, speaking Mandarin, regardless of the cost to other languages, people's identities, communities, families, etc. Okay. So, uh, and does everyone else uh, agree? Maybe just speak very briefly to that. They wipe out every, basically, basically wipe out every other language except uh, Mandarin Chinese over the process of the next couple decades. Mr. Togochuk. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, their goal is very clear. They they are stating publicly uh, their their uh, the Chinese authorities are stating their uh, goals very publicly, and then they're saying uh, all uh, the fifty five so called um, ethnic minorities must uh, adopt and embrace the the uh, Chinese Zhonghua uh, nationality or Chinese nationality. That's that's the uh, stated goal. And um, so the language, the uh, eliminating language and uh, forcing all those 55 uh, ethnic minorities to speak um, Chinese is not just the only goal. Actually, their ultimate goal is to turn these people's identity into the Chinese or Zhonghua uh, nationality identity. So it's both about everyone speaking Mandarin, but that is the underlying goal is to wipe out the ethnic identity of people across China, basically uh, genocide against dozens and dozens of, of, of the diverse cultures of, of, the, of the country. Uh, Ms. Taitung, uh, when you look at really the, uh, the, the, manner, the strategies being used, including this absolutely horrific separation of small children from their, their families to boarding schools. I think you said 80% of the children are separated, some 800 to 900,000 children, if I caught those numbers right. So do you see a path in which China, Chinese government is seeking to essentially wipe out the Tibetan language with another generation? 
Yes, absolutely. And I think the, um, the focus now on kindergartens or preschoolers, the focus on four and five year olds uh, really shows us that it is um, these children are learning entirely from such a young age entirely in Chinese or Mandarin and they are um, they are so young they're, they're they're also being taught like just so that their psych their psychological foundation uh, will be sort of trained to sort of think about Chinese culture and Chinese um, you know to to have no almost because they don't live with their parents and their families for the majority of their lives um, even if they're just living five days a week in these schools they are you know the idea is to really turn change them on the inside who they yes. are fundamentally so as to wipe out resistance yeah it's so much more than than simply language and mr abdulwelly um also do you do you see that kind of the Chinese goal within a generation is to wipe out the, the Uyghur language? Yes, the Chinese goal is, um, I think, not only wipe out Uyghur language, but also uh, let Uyghur become uh, not the modern Chinese, let them become ancient Chinese. Because um, from my um, documentation, those Uyghur kids in uh, like a kids camp, they were forced to recite ancient Chinese texts not the modern texts, and uh, force them to wear ancient Chinese clothes, not the modern Chinese clothes, and let them recite uh, like uh, something not relevant with this uh, modern society. And I think the ultimate goal is make them more Chinese than ordinary Chinese. So, uh, Mr. Togochug, uh, you observed that in January of last year, so uh, some 15 months ago, Chinese authorities announced that the legal protections for recognized minority languages are unconstitutional. Of course, it's the Constitution, Article 4 of the Chinese Constitution, which provides for those protections. So it is essentially, can we essentially say that the Chinese Constitution has been invalidated by the Chinese government? and that the protection in the Chinese, Chinese Constitution, Article 4, no longer exists? Well, uh, that's correct. So, uh, as we all know, China is not uh, a country of rule of law. So, yes, the, uh, the Chinese Constitution is still there, but in the same time, uh, because of the Mongolian, uh, the large-scale protest, they came up with the idea that uh, the actually the na Chinese National Congress uh, announced that uh, the all local laws, including the uh, ethnic minority autonomy laws, and um, some r r other regulations on the uh, minority languages, in particular Mongolian language, they said it's unconstitutional, and then they said uh, these must be uh, chained. So that's that's their their um, uh, statement. Uh, so the uh, the goal is clear, right? They they just uh, use whatever um, uh, you know method available to just just change completely uh, wipe out the Mongolian language, and and uh, so they just in this effort they even um, you know uh, invalidate their own constitution. And Mr. Abdulwali, and, and my time is running short, so this will be my last question. Um, you note in your testimony that in 2013, there was a, a movement among Uyghurs to adopt this slogan, if the Chinese constitution protects our languages, then it is our turn to protect it. So it was like, okay, hey, the constitution lays out protection, let's, let's locally and, and protect and ensure that uh, Article 4 is, is followed. But the Chinese reaction was to essentially say, well, we didn't really, we don't, the constitution doesn't really, we're throwing that, we're throwing that out. So your effort to, to seize upon those constitutional protections was unfortunately unsuccessful. Is that, is that a, a fair way to put it? Yes, that's correct. Uh, that's uh, our slogan and that's my, uh, I tried to uh, follow the uh, law and I, tried to practice my uh, constitutional rights and but at the end i didn't succeed yeah well uh thank you all very much this big picture 
China has abandoned its constitutional protections. It's wiping out language, but it's not just language. It's trying to wipe out the minority cultures across China. And that's the big picture I want to keep uh, coming back to. Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Congressman McGovern, as well. Um, and to our panelists, um, I've got to briefly run into another meeting, so I'm going to cut right to the chase and just ask each of our panelists the following question. Can you please share your analysis uh, of how the CCP's increased repression of ethnic minorities within China fits into its broader long-term strategy uh, for consolidation of political control? Go ahead, Mr. Ayo. Hello? Yeah. Um, mm, you rephrase your question? I'm sorry. No problem. My question is, uh, how does the continued and increased repression of ethnic minorities by the Chinese Communist Party fit into the CCP's broader long-term political and state strategy? Uh, yes, uh, like uh, depending on uh, uh, Xi Jinping's speech uh, he made in uh, 2014 in Urumqi and uh, like the one very like uh, specific term that uh, uh, break the root. It means that like um, break this culture like separate uh, this now the implementing that like a boarding school and boarding kindergarten and those uh, things just uh, imp just the like uh, implementation of his order like break the root it means that like uh, those kids uh, uh, replace their uh, homes and they replace their homeland and replace their culture and uh, another like uh, uh, Xi Jinping uh, stressed that um, uh, strengths Zhonghua uh, identity. It means that the only identity allowed in China, and uh, that's why, like uh, Chinese government had this uh, concentration camp and uh, force those millions of people uh, speak uh, Chinese in that uh, uh, so-called uh, vocational center. And the third, the uh, Chinese government uh, transferred the uh, Uyghurs from their own homeland to uh, Chinese uh, cities. Just in 2020, more than uh, 50,000 Uyghurs transferred to Xinjiang. It means that like uh, the uh, ultimate uh, goal to like not only let them to speak Chinese, but let them like disappear in uh, major uh, Chinese majority in uh, Chinese uh, mainland. If I may, uh, can I uh, re respond to um, Senator Asif's uh, question? So, uh, yes, so, uh, what's happening in China is um, it's continuation of of what China has been implementing uh, in in these three nations, uh, especially in in uh, Mongolian case. Um, the the new policy, new cultural genocide policy, um, followed by the the, the so-called second generation bilingual education, is actually is um, uh, considered by the Mongolians as the final step of China's overall cultural genocide policy uh, that is uh, intended to systematically destroy uh, the language tradition and identity of of the mongolian people as a whole so uh if you look at look at the, the history of uh the past 73 years history of uh, southern mongolia uh as early as 19 late 1940s even before the establishment of the people's republic of china chinese communist party took over uh the southern mongolia and implemented the so-called uh, land reform movement, and then they uh, executed uh, tens of thousands of Mongolians and confiscated uh, confiscate their land, 
And then in the 1950s, uh, the Mongolian uh, intellectual, uh, elite intellectuals were persecuted. And the 1960s and 1970s, for example, there was a large um, a skill um, genocide campaign, actually. It's, it's, uh, uh, in, in this campaign, uh, at least 100,000 uh, Mongolians were uh, tortured to death and half million persecuted. At that time, Mongolian population is only 1.5 uh, million. That means one third of the population is uh, affected by this policy. And then in 19, uh, 2001, Chinese government implemented uh, another set of po policy toward the Mongolian traditional way of life to wipe out the Mongolian traditional way of life. The policies are called like um, ecological migration and total ban of our livestock grazing. Uh, under this policy, Mongolian traditional way of life is targeted. And then uh, herders, Mongolian herders who graze their uh, uh, animals on, on their own land is considered criminals. And then, so now they are, they are targeting Mongolian language. So this is, continuing pattern. It's not just, you know, that the, uh, the recent uh, policy is not just, um, you know, isolated policy. It's a continuation of overall Chinese policy to destroy the, uh, the entire nation of Southern Mongolia. Thank you, Mr. Tobachov. Yeah, I may. Please, go ahead. I, uh, yeah, I agree completely. I think this is the continuation of, um, you know, destructive policies and an intention to really, you know, Xi Jinping has just completely accelerated uh, this um, genocidal project in Tibet and uh, East Turkestan and, and Southern Mongolia. And I think we can see, you know, with, um, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping, there can be no challenge to their authority. And that's what, uh, Tibetans and Uyghurs and Southern Mongolians do by trying to maintain our distinct way of life, our language, our, you know, our separate national identities. And um, if you look at China's, you know, threatening of Taiwan, if you look at the crackdown in Hong Kong, if you look at the attack on India, I think we can see that it doesn't end with, you know, it's not like it's just about Tibetans or Uyghurs or, you know, what China considers, considers its internal um, issues. It, it goes well beyond. And, and Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party have imperial ambitions. I mean, they are, there is a belief that they um, have the right to rule over us on their borders and, and to have, should have a, a, a greater position of power in the world should have more influence at whatever the cost and to wipe out dissent and to attack people fundamentally who they are um, to try to destroy or erase us. I think that, you know, we can see with Russia uh, right now uh, under Putin, the threat that Russia poses to global peace and security, I believe is the same from the Chinese government. And I think uh, no matter what their propaganda says, they trust us. They're very, very good at using um, benign sounding positive language to mask their intentions. But, but we, we know the truth of, of you know, what they want to do. And they're doing it to us in a way the whole world can see. And I think that's why it's imperative on some level. It's not, it's also self-interest, I think, globally to help to, to, to try to push China back to stop this, you know, these genocides happening before our eyes because uh, it doesn't just stop here, I don't think. If I may uh, just extend on some of those uh, points there. So with reference to particularly the groups that I've uh, worked with that I call these unrecognized um, languages, unrecognized groups, in terms of state and political strategy, originally when these policies were formed in um, several decades ago, the the aim of not recognizing those groups, and it was a deliberate process, uh, the aim of that was to uh, accelerate their assimilation. Uh, the idea was that those unrecognized groups would assimilate into the 
recognized 56 nationalities, then all of those groups would assimilate into a single, basically Han Chinese socialist unity. So it was a, it was a deliberate strategy to speed up social evolution uh, towards the, the socialist future, which would, which would also coincidentally be Han Chinese. Um, and, and so when those structures were put in place, those structures of recognition, the legal structures, constitutional uh, freedoms for language, the policies of ethnic autonomy and so on, uh, they were all they were all done with an aim to deliver deliberately drive assimilatory processes. Uh, and they have been working as planned for decades now. And we see that in the fate of these unrecognized languages, which um, which people are no longer basically able to transmit to their children or can only do so with great difficulty. Um, under Xi Jinping in particular, the that goal of accelerating uh, assimilation has taken on goals which are primarily related to China's place on the global stage. It's taken on a geopolitical significance that uh, those structures that uh, accelerate assimilation are now driving towards producing greater unity, integration, and therefore power that will accelerate China's uh, place in the world order, which uh, you know, the aim is to, to is, is an ascendant China with a much broader, more important, powerful role on the world stage. And, and, and that place on the world stage will, will be built on the deliberate um, destruction of these communities. Thank you all. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you to our co-chairs. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Ossoff. And uh, um, co-chair McGovern, did you want to ask a second set of questions? Yeah, uh, briefly. Uh, uh, Dr. Roach, you speak to the UN de Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a mechanism for Indigenous Peoples of China to defend their languages. Um, you say that the U.S. should formally endorse the non-binding declaration as the three other countries who initially voted against it, Canada, UK, Australia, have done. Would endorsement give our government a stronger moral position to urge China to allow its citizens to participate in the uh, UN process? Yes, it absolutely would um, give the US a stronger uh, moral foundation for uh, making these claims against China. Um, we see this repeatedly that when these issues are raised against China, whether it's in uh, diplomatic or governmental forums or whether it's um, in the media or social media, that whenever these accusations are, are brought against China about what they're actually doing, the, the first strategy that they um, always go to is one of deflection, to deflect the query back on the accuser and to say, uh, you have no right to accuse us of this when you yourself have done it in your past, you are doing it now, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, and then they often go to other strategies of, of outright denial, conditional denial, and so on and so on. But the, but the, first, um, the first rhetorical strategy is always to deflect the comment back on the accuser. And anything that can be, that can be done in that regards will approve the effectiveness of any efforts to hold China accountable for what they, what they are doing. Um, these assimilatory, eliminatory programs. Thank you. So hopefully that clarifies. No, it, it, it does. Thank you. And thank you for being with us this, I, I don't know what time it is. What time is it where you are? Uh, it's after midnight now. We started at midnight. So yeah, well, thank you. We, we, we appreciate you staying up for us here. To, uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Tatong, um, regarding the residential boarding school system in Tibetan areas, can you expand a little bit on the elements of coercion? I mean, do authorities order families to send their kids away? Uh, do they make it a fait accompli by closing local schools? Or is it something else? Um, and how would we find out more information about the schools for four and five year olds, uh, which you say Chinese authorities are trying to hide? Thank you for the question, Chairman McGovern. Um, yeah, it's it's 
the Chinese government is making it impossible for Tibetan parents to do anything but comply, both because of the consolidation of schools and so closing all the local schools, all the alternatives, the monastery schools, the Tibetan run private schools. Um, so Tibetans on the one hand have no choice in most places if they want their children to get an education, they have to send them away. Uh, at the same time, parents do, of course, resist and refuse. Um, and when they do, they are threatened. So they can be threatened with financial punishments. Um, they can be threatened that, you know, the, the number one thing is if you don't send your child now, say, to boarding um, preschool, then you won't, they won't be able to go and join later um, uh, at, at grade one or in primary school. And so Tibetan parents are really left with and, and Tibetans know, anyone under Chinese Communist Party rule knows, you don't disagree, you don't push back to do in any meaningful way, will be considered a threat to the state and you'll be charged or could be, you know, held accountable for some serious, um, you know, political charges, even though all you're trying to do is keep your child at home where, you know, uh, where you can protect them and watch over them. I know with the boarding preschools so we're, we're really working to try to understand uh, more about the picture on the ground and we need you know governments and, and and everyone to be asking china about the boarding preschools um i think that the the you know tibetan parents who have tried to we've been hearing reports recently you know tibetan parents don't want their kids to go to these schools they don't want to send them away so young when they have to like in nomadic communities we've been hearing that they will go and one nomadic family will move to the township and live in their car, you know, to be near to the kids from that, that are in that boarding preschool. And the other families back home will take care of their work and their business. And then the families will take turn by turn. It's having a very, very hard, you know, um, detrimental effect on the life of people, nomads and rural people. Uh, to have such, you know, small children taken away. And then, of course, the things parents try to do, just like in Canada and the residential school um, history there, just like in the U.S. And, you know, when, when these children are taken away, parents try to go and be near them or do, you know, what they can um, to, to protect them because they're being taken out of, their, out of their hands. And we need to know more. China needs to answer um, and and tell us what are the numbers just trying to piece together this picture from chinese state media from chinese government sources at every level from chinese academics and other academic studies um it really is an incredible challenge and that's absolutely intentional on the part of the chinese government to hide this because they know it's wrong thank you and i i apologize i have to go to a another meeting uh and but before i yield back to uh, Chairman Merkel, let me just thank this this incredible panel. Um, uh, you know, this is this is a important issue. Uh, it goes to the issue of identity. It goes to the issue of China trying to wipe out an entire culture. Uh, and um, and I think uh, Ms. Tetung, you had mentioned that one of the reasons why they do this is to try to squash resistance. You know, on the other hand, I could make an argument that their repression and they're trying to rob people of their identity, I think, only increases resistance uh, in the sense that people are just um, horrified that uh, there is a entity that wants to rob them of their identity, of their history, of their culture, of their language. Um, and so, you know, as some people have said on this panel, it's really important for us to be able to fund initiatives that will actually protect these languages um, um, and to find ways to allow people to, um, you know, have access to um, appropriate instruction to be able to pass this on from to the next generations. But uh, you have given us some ideas on things that we need to do in the upcoming appropriations process uh, that will be coming up in, the, in a matter of weeks uh, and also some uh, follow up questions uh, to the Chinese government. But uh, but this has been an excellent uh, panel, and I want to thank you all. And um, I yield back to uh, Chairman Merkley. Thank you very much, Co-Chair McGovern. And um, I do have some additional questions I'll, I'll continue with. And let me start, Dr. Roche, with the question as to whether the Chinese government is also trying to 
uh, wipe out or start the process of um, eliminating the Cantonese dialect in favor of the Mandarin dialect. Uh, thank you for that question. I'll, I'll just give a very brief answer because this is not my specific area of uh, research. I haven't um, done work in this area, so my understanding of it is from a very broad general background. But uh, so basically, in terms of policy, the same policy of erasure applies, which is that there is um, uh, limited to no formal support for the Cantonese language. A lot of the support is um, uh, ad hoc and superficial, uh, which then uh, makes it very difficult for the community to sustain their language. Uh, we know that in the past that there have been protests uh, against the imposition of Mandarin uh, in the Cantonese speaking communities. Um, and interestingly, the protests uh, uh, seem to have had a knock on effect in Tibet, uh, in part inspiring uh, language protests there, emboldening people. And we see, and I think that that's an important thing to note is that uh, all of these language contexts are connected. When one group is able to stand up and defend their language, if that information is available to other people and they know that 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 emboldens them uh it encourages them it reminds them of their rights and so on which is in, important but, but beyond that i would not like to uh, comment further on the situation of cantonese because i feel like i don't have the, the the adequate expertise are all of the university admissions in mandarin all the university exams Across the entire country or just in the Cantonese context? Across the entire country. Again, I don't think that I have the up-to-date information on that. I'll pass that over to perhaps one of the other panelists would know. Uh, my, uh, I, I haven't been able to enter China, uh, so my uh, on-the-ground access to information is now limited, unfortunately. So it, for each of you, uh, in regard to Mongolia, Tibet, uh, Uyghur Autonomous Area, um, are all the university examinations in uh, Mandarin? Um, yes, it is. And uh, we have a uh, Uyghur exam uh, until 2017. And after that, all uh, college entrance exams are in Chinese. Um. In 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 uh, uh, Mongolian areas, uh, yes. Now the all college exam is uh, it has to be in Chinese, and then there was until recently, until this this uh, new policy, there was some very limited um, uh, number of colleges uh, had uh, some some majors in in Mongolia. For example, Mo only Mongolian. Uh, literature and linguistic major was um, uh, the, the students are allowed to take exam in Mongolian, but now all these are changing. And then, so all students have to take the exam in Chinese. And Ms. Tetong? Yes, I believe that's true. And it's also the, um, you know, it's important to point out that for the, the, the pressure on uh, Tibetan society and on the on language and culture is coming from both sides so um the 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 children the youngest children are having the language stolen from them and and those uh in higher academic study are suddenly not able to so they amalgamated the different departments so there used to be tibetan studies and mongolian studies and Uyghur studies and they under the common language um policy they they sort of put everyone together and, and the only way to teach is in Mandarin because Tibetans will not speak Uyghur and Uyghurs will not speak Tibetan. And so suddenly the, this entire, there have been Tibetan um, uh, uh, academics and education specialists who have been working hard for decades to try and promote Tibetan language and Tibetan curriculum and cultural content and everything. And suddenly, all of them are faced with just with with no options to continue with their work 
and Tibetan language itself. I mean, as one Tibetan education policy expert from Tibet raised during the Cultural Revolution told us recently, he sees this between the policy for the little kids, the policies on, for, for the, you know, the higher education, and of course what's happening in the monasteries and on the grasslands, he sees this in a way as a threat that could be the end of our history. And that just really struck me um, when you think of it all together. Yeah. It was in that perspective of seeing these many, many different strategies from different angles in which I was inquiring kind of about the plan to, to wipe out the language and essentially the culture in a, in a, in a generation. Um, you, you spoke about a, a pop singer, um, age 26, I believe, who uh, self-immolated him, himself. Was he allowed to sing? Did he become a star within Tibet or was he outside Tibet? Was he allowed to sing in Tibetan? inside Tibet and become popular culturally in, the, in that language? Yes, uh, he was. He, so uh, he in particular really had, um, he, he was famous in Chinese um, uh, circles because he, he was known because he participated in all these Chinese um, talent shows, like the, the, the music sort of idol type shows. And so he became really well known um, but he would do, you could see, you can see in his lyrics and in his story, he really tried to promote Tibetan language and identity and to have a message in there about the importance of Tibetan homeland, the Tibetan sort of, without saying it, the Tibetan nation and our, our cultural roots. And, and I think the key is if you look from the outside, and this is what China will say, Tibetans have freedom of expression. Look at, they sing in Tibetan and they, um, you know, you can see the kids dressed in their Tibetan clothing. And in the end, they do allow uh, a certain amount of cultural freedom and expression, but within a very, 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 you know, very constrained, very limited. There was a, there was a platform recently, a Chinese social media platform that was streaming a conversation between two Tibetan um, pop stars, very well known. And one was saying to the other, we can't do this. Um, we shouldn't speak in Tibetan on this platform or they will shut us down. So you can see, yes. you know, and, and I think really within a generation, we may see the end. If these genocidal policies are allowed to go, go ahead, we may see the end of Tibetans who can even sing and express themselves in sort of secondary discourse in Tibetan language. Well, it's a very powerful story when someone who is so successful and so young takes their own life in protest. And can you give us his name once again? Yeah, Tsewan Norbu was his name, uh, 25 years old. Thank you. And I want to turn to um, uh, Mr. Abdeweli. Uh, you note in your testimony that the written language was changed from a Uyghur alphabet to a Cyrillic alphabet to a Sinicized Latin script. How much does changing the writing play into interrupting kind of the generational cultural traditions and language abilities? Um, like my father, uh, when he went to high school, he educated in like a Cyrillic alphabet. And then uh, my mother, younger than him, he educated in like a Latin alphabet and they like uh, we, we have at home, we have books in acrylic alphabet and we have books in Latin alphabet, but no one can read what what's what's it because it's different alphabet. And then when we start to uh, our uh, primary school, we went the uh, first year we study like Latin alphabet, then next year we study like my, I study like uh, uh, Arabic alphabet and my brothers cannot read my book and I can I cannot read their books and then like uh, because of that Latin alphabet implemented in uh, Uyghur homeland more than 20 years so like uh, um, a generation uh, become illiterate like in 20 because the Latin alphabet implemented 20 years and then the suddenly change it to Arabic alphabet and then those people become illiterate suddenly so oh, we have three times illiteracy, like uh, rush, like like use acrylic. They don't take know like uh, Latin, and then they know Latin, and they don't know the second, the third one. So they have like a th third generation that, depending on the like uh, this uh, uh, alphabetic change, 
and this people become illiteracy. Yeah, thank, thank you. Congressman Steele, I see you've rejoined us. Did you want to ask any additional questions? I just want to say thank you. And this is so necessary that everybody has to hear and what CCP has been doing. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all the witnesses. And you know what? I'm going to speak up. I mean, I'm going to speak against the CCP, and I've been doing this since I got elected 2020. So let's work together and let's make sure that whole world knows that, you know, what CCP has been doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman Steele. It's a really valuable contribution, and, and it's so important to have these, these hearings so that uh, more of us become educated and articulate about these forms of, of oppression. And I just I wanted to ask one uh, last question, uh, Mr. Abdulwali, uh, and this ties into a previous hearing we've had, but when you uh, advocated for Uyghur kindergartens and worked to establish them basically under that vision from, from Article 4 of the Constitution, your family members uh, were uh, oppressed. And I believe your brother and sister have been imprisoned. Uh, we understand your niece, I'm very sorry to hear, passed away in detention uh, two years ago after returning to Xinjiang from Japan. Did they face imprisonment for their own activities or was it retaliation in part to send a message to advocates abroad? Um, like I started my modern language campaign in uh, 2011. Uh, September uh, 15th, my first uh, mother language kindergarten and uh, then my mother language schools. And because of that, I got arrested in 2013, and, uh, August 19th. And uh, I, um, uh, in, in Turkey in 2017, because of like Uyghur students arrested in Egypt, uh, July 4th, 2017, and uh, I received their voice message and written message and I, I spoke up. And because of this, uh, my uh, older brother got arrested and uh, I learned that he sentenced 14 years. And then uh, like, uh, because of my activism, my like uh, younger sister, she forced to denounce me more than a year, like started in 2016 till 2017, September, entire year she, like criticized me and denounced me and like uh, claimed that I'm a separatist or some, something like that. And then at the end, she also ended up in the concentration camp and then sentenced uh, 12 years. I think it's the like, uh, and then like in 2019 in November, I participated leaking the document, uh, Xinjiang file and Karkash list. And because of that, my uh, wife is family member because at that time we have some contact and then uh, like my wife's family members uh, got arrested and 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 so i think those are related to like uh, when i take some action when i speak up in the, this next step the retaliation so i think it's related to the retaliation and let me uh, like uh, stop and uh, like my uh, niece when she was in japan and she uh, told me really clearly that like uh, you became a hero and my father and my uh, aunt become victim because of you. So um, I feel really sorry what happened to her. She went back to Japan because of she just under this uh, like control of uh, Chinese police through Chinese social media app WeChat. The, like the Chinese police there always uh, force her to stop me and but she couldn't stop me. And because of this, at the end, she like um, went back to China and she died in detention. That place, like I was first arrested and sexually abused there. So I feel, I feel really sorry about it. I I I hope this retaliation will stop and I hope this atrocity will stop. So, it's it's absolutely uh, horrific, and um, I'm sure. Um, very effective in in uh, suppressing conversation about China's many assaults on human rights, but this uh, re retaliation against family for freedom of speech abroad is just. I think about this, and I, I think, why do we allow any 
import, any recognition, any um, validation of the Chinese government, given the, the many, many uh, crimes against humanity uh, that we've um, witnessed through this series of, of hearings. And so I'm um, thank you for sharing that story, and uh, and uh, we all just are in great empathy with um, the horrific situation it puts you in, and everyone who wants to speak up from their heart to to about human rights abuses inside China. I really appreciate all of you on the panel for sharing your knowledge and experience. Um, we have to keep speaking out. We cannot let Chinese pressure in any form against our companies, against uh, advocates within our country, against um, uh, Chinese citizens abroad, uh, stop us from scrutinizing and, and uh, publicizing uh, these, um, uh, ac these activities. With, without scrutiny, without publicization, there's no chance uh, to diminish uh, this this strategy of uh, wiping out the languages and the cultures uh, of the uh, the many groups within within China. And with that, um, I know I have an official script here somewhere for closing. Um, specifically, the record will remain open until the close of business on Friday, April 8th. And for any members who would like to put additional things into the record, uh, please, uh, you are welcome to do so. And that, I extend that invitation to uh, our um, panel of, of experts as well. Thank you. And with that, the hearing is adjourned.